Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Rhinebeck Historical Society's special summer program. We realize that with the epidemic going on, it's going to be a long time before we can have programs back at the Star Library. So we're testing out this program using Zoom, which has been very successful in our planning board meetings and our Historical Society board meetings. So you can see from the background behind me that clearly I'm talking tonight about the Dutchess County Fair. When the fair was canceled this year, I was disappointed because it meant that our grandsons would not be coming up to the fair, going on rides with us, and of course, going to the pig races, which is their absolute favorite. And they talk about it all year long, wait till the fair and the fabulous pig race. So, because of the cancellation, I began thinking about why was there a fair in the first place? How did it all get started? So I did some research and I want to thank uh, Melanie Moore from the Dutchess County Historical Society, Mary Ann Cowles from the Pleasant Valley Historical Society, and the Museum of Rhinebeck History for some of the fabulous photographs I'm going to show you tonight. So let me start the PowerPoint and we will get going. In 1806, the early precursor to the Dutchess County Fair was formed in Poughkeepsie. Bill Jeffrey sent me an article from the 1928 Dutchess County Yearbook that explains why we have fairs. Following the period of economic depression that was created by the War of the Revolution, Dutchess County enjoyed an era of great prosperity. The prosperity was based upon agriculture throughout the county, the large productive farms, and the farmer was the moneyed man of the community. Remember, this was way before the Industrial Revolution, so farming was the main uh, activity in, in Dutchess County, and they wanted to find a way to showcase farming. So the first fair was held in 1809. It was held intermittently around the county until October 16, 1841, in Washington Hollow, in the town of Pleasant Valley, the Dutchess County Historical Society was created. And the first fair was held in October 1842 at Washington Hollow in Pleasant Valley. And here is a picture of the Octagon Pavilion. That was the main uh, activity center of the fair. I have Another picture, here's the Octagon Pavilion, some other ex exhibit halls, people on horseback, and obviously a stagecoach bringing people to the fair. This was way before automobiles. Here's another picture, here's the grandstand, a octagonal building, other exhibition halls, and of course, a track. Here's the last picture I have of the fairgrounds. And here you can see the octagonal building, other exhibits and tents, and the track that they had events on. And of course, I love the parking lot because it's horses and buggies, not cars in the mid 1800s. Here's another picture they sent me. I said, what is this? Gentleman sitting on the back with some long pole, obviously pulled by a horse or oxen, and paddles with needles on them. It looks like some kind of harvesting machine. And Bill Jeffway came through for me and sent me this. Adrian's Platt Company, Adrian's Mower, and Adrian's Reaper, manufactured in Poughkeepsie, New York, and here is even a picture of the factory, and it says the Adrian's Reaper at work, and there we have it, the gentleman sitting on the back, and these long paddles with nails coming down and harvesting the wheat. So I thank Bill for that. So, exactly where was Washington Hollow? Here's the map of the fairgrounds. It shows Route 82, Route 44. Millbrook was to the right, and 100 years later, the Taconic would be to the left. So here is the race course, the grandstand, the octagonal building, and the other exhibit halls. So I said, so what is in Washington Hollow today? What does it look like? So I went to Google Earth, and it is the New York State 
Troop K Police Headquarters at 82 and 44. So nothing is left of the early fair. Now, the fair alternated between Washington Hollow and Poughkeepsie uh, until 1888, when it moved to the Poughkeepsie Driving Park. I only have two images of, of the early Poughkeepsie Fair. This is from 1844, and it says Floral Hall, Ladies' Home, Manufacturer's Lodge, Farmer's Hall. is a big tent, and of course the four halls. And they do the same thing we do today. The world's largest pumpkin, the world's best apple pie, the world's greatest floral arrangement, the, the most handsome bull, and the strongest horse. And the same things went on in uh, 150 or more years ago. Is an etching showing it. Here's the tent and the four buildings. And here are horses and cows being exhibited around the uh, fairgrounds. So in 1888, it moved to the Hudson River Driving Park. So where was that? Here it is, here's Vassar College in 1888. Hudson River Driving Park below Hooker Avenue. So once again, I said, well, what's there today? Vassar's still here is the main building of Vassar and many, many more buildings. There is a sports complex, but it was below Hooker Avenue where the fairgrounds was, and it's a housing development. There's nothing left there. So what were some of the uses they made of the driving track? Well, they had bike races. I love the straw hats. That was a thing of the early uh, 1900s, as was these kinds of hats and outfits. I guess the guys in white must have been the judges. They raced cars. It was cars in 1908. Now, it's, the cars were invented a couple of years ago, and still they found a way to race the cars, the first thing they thought of. And they had horses on the track, of course. And here is an early picture from the early 1900s, number 85, if you look closely, it is a very young and handsome FDR, way before 1921 when polio struck and crippled him. I have another interesting postcard from the driving park, 1906 fair. This is just the way these horses look as we saw them. One is named King and the other Queen. Here is Queen jumping off this long ramp, way high platform into a lake. No idea how they were able to get the horses to do that, nor would that possibly be allowed today. So what else did they have there? The exhibition hall at Driving Park, it's from a newspaper, so it's not a very good image, but you know, it, it looks pretty good to, to give you a feel for what the size of the building was. I do, however, have a wonderful inside picture, looking very much like exhibit halls today at the fair. G. Shildy and Son furniture, pianos, perfect roofing. In mirror writing here is Poughkeepsie's greatest daily, the Evening Star, confections, and Lucky Platt Company, Poughkeepsie's leading department store. It was, I've been told, a fabulous department store, an early precursor to Macy's or Bloomingdale's that we have today. I did scan a book about it. I'm not sure if it's up on the web yet. And I read about it recently, and I think they're turning the Lucky Platt building into housing in Poughkeepsie. The last image I have is of the grandstand and some tents in 1909 at the fair. Now, it, the fair ran into difficulty in the war years. It was only held once in 1917 during the war. In 1918, they ran out of money, were not able to pay the rent for the Kipsey Driving Park, and so, with the help of Tracy Dows, they moved it in 1919 to Springbrook Park. Here's a picture four years before from 1915 showing a very bucolic and beautiful tree-lined dirt road, which today is Route 9, and one side is the fairgrounds, and the other side in 1929, they built the Northern Dutchess Health Center, the precursor to the hospital that we have today. So last year the fair celebrated its 100th anniversary 
in Rhinebeck, 1919, 2019. And one of the first uses of the fairgrounds was a fair, a, a parade, July 4th, 1919, to celebrate the end of the war. Remember, the armistice came on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, 1918, but that was just the armistice. The Treaty of Versailles was signed June 28, 1919, in uh, uh, that famous railway car that 20 years later, Hitler made the French surrender in. And so here is the July 4th parade a week after, this, after the war ended, some nurses, some an army band. I love this beautiful little camera. Photographer taking pictures of the fair. Yes, I love this Dutchess County Ambulance. It's just a fabulous, fabulous vehicle. I'd love to have this today. And it was one of the uh, things in the, in the parade. There's some more um, floats in the parade. There's people being drawn by horses. I can't quite make it out. It's not a very clear picture. And the last image I have of the parade is the, an army vehicle wrapped in stars and stripes and uh, run by soldiers up here. And uh, we, have, we have pictures of some other stories about what it was like in the parade. So what I'm going to do for the second half of this short program is to just go through um, the pictures that I obtained and starting with 1920 into the 1950s and show you some really great pictures from the fair. Here's a 1920 picture. It says, going to the fair, and it says Dutchess County Fair here. I love this little car. I don't know what free air means. I thought air was always free, but maybe it's some kind of filling station to fill tires on cars. And it's some house in the buildings that I don't recognize. In 1920, they had mule races. I didn't know mules raced, but uh, here's the, an old grandstand, and here's a lady, and I think they're called sulkies, racing mules. Here's a 1921 Ferris wheel and a, a merry-go-round and some, you know, similar to the kind of rides we have 100 years later. 1921, they had horse racing. And um, it looks like these two gentlemen are in the air. I don't know how they're staying on these horses, but they, they wanted to win. And uh, it's great that they had these events. I wish we still had some kind of horse racing competition today at the fair. Here's a 1927 picture of the troopers. They're all lined up looking very spiffy with their nice boots and these interesting pants that the troopers wear. Here's a picture from 1928 and it's from the DAR and there's the grand prize winning float with all these flowers on an old truck and it won first prize for the best float at the 1928 fair. So what did it look like? Here's an image that I found showing, here's the grandstand, the old grandstand. They had a track, horse show and pony ring, livestock pavilions, carnival grounds with rides, similar to what we have today. And uh, it looks pretty similar, even though it was 90 years ago. Here's a picture of 1932, and the, the caption on this one was, the grand champion bull. And he's, he's quite handsome. Here's a guy you know, 1937, FDR, petting a cow. And next to him is Eleanor. This is, of course, after he had polio. And from after 1921, he was mostly seen sitting down or sitting in a car because he didn't like uh, standing up on those braces. Here's a 1930s picture as well, FDR looking at a a horse, and this uh, woman next to him is Sarah Roosevelt, and I think you all know the, the stories of the rivalries between Sarah Roosevelt and Eleanor during the years of uh, Franklin's marriage to her. Here's one more picture of the president. He's sitting in a car, and this is his son and his son's horse at a fair also in the 1930s. Here's a picture from the 1940, from 1940. And here's these kids standing around, they're waiting online to get some treats or go on rides. And I got a little sad because it looked so beautiful and peaceful. And a year later, Pearl Harbor would be bombed. And these boys 
would be joining the army and going off to war. So it's a very peaceful time and they have no idea what's about to happen. Here's one of my favorite photos from the 1940s. It's a pie eating contest. And I guess the idea was to put your hands behind your back and we eat with no cheating. I love this boy with his tongue sticking out. I just watched Joe and Chestnut at Coney Island on the 4th of July eating 70 something hot dogs in 10 minutes. It's quite gross, but he won for the 13th year in a row. And so I guess pie eating contests were pretty big in the 1940s. Air, airplane ride, just like we have today at the Airdrome, you could <clears throat> pay for a ride around Rhinebeck in an airplane at the fair. Here's a 1940s carousel. I've seen some of these old carousels that are saved around the state. And uh, the prettiest not in color because they were, they were painted quite beautifully. Here's something we don't have today, but we should bring back. It's a tram. Now, they have trams at the, uh, the Botanical Gardens and, and at airports to bring people from far out parking lots into the grounds. And it would be great today. Sometimes people park way out, almost at tops on Saturday and Sunday, and they're tired walking a half a mile to the gate. It'd be great if they could be picked up and driven to the front gate. Bring back the tram. Here's some 1940s tractors. We still, of course, have tractor displays at the fair today. And I love the 1940s cars lined up on the hill. Here's another strange competition we do not have today. A boy on stilts. I guess they had a stilt walking competition. This guy in white must be the judge. And we, I, we, we should bring back a lot of the things we don't have anymore. In 1941, before the war, they had this big gun. It looks to me like an anti-aircraft gun with soldiers sitting around. And this was in 1941. The war did not start until December, so that would have been after the fair. And here is sound detector. I said, what on earth is this thing? So I looked up World War II sound detector on Google, and it said, these, these guys are giant ears and they could hear planes coming for miles. And so the operator had headphones that would stand in the middle and listen for enemy planes. So speaking of enemy planes, here's a 1943 exhibit at the fair. The Army AWS Air Force observers. So who were they? They were volunteers with binoculars that would look for and listen for enemy activity. I think you all know they patrol the beaches and look for submarines or uh, landing along the beaches. And others learn to identify these planes and look for a German plane, especially a fifth columnist, trying to come down the river. And let me show you why. Here's a picture I took from the Franklin Forest website. Here's their fire tower which is also one of the many observation towers in World War II, because look at the view. You should go there if you haven't been there. It's fabulous. You get a great view of the river, and they were very worried that a fifth columnist, either Japanese or German, would, would get a plane and fly down the river, which was a direct line to the president's house in Hyde Park. So that's what the AWS Corps was. Here's a 1944 picture of some soldiers. This guy looks a little uncomfortable. He must be a city boy like me. Here's a 1946 picture of Governor and Mrs. Dewey. And uh, I think we all know that famous newspaper headline. Dewey beats Truman in 1948. And of course, they had to retract that the following day when it turns out Governor Dewey lost to Truman. Church of the Messiah booth, food booth, table service, sandwiches. They ran a restaurant to raise money for the church during many of the fairs in that, during that time. Now remember I said it wasn't until 1950s that the Dutchess County Agricultural Society purchased the land from the Springbrook Driving, the Springbrook uh, Park Association. And 
Here's the Springbrook Driving Club, 1948. And here he is riding in that sulky with his horse. Here's a 1948 picture of, horse, of riders on horses. We still, of course, have horse competitions today. We have Western and English. These people are in English saddles. And uh, it's still a big part of the fair. There's a 1950 aerial, and you can see carousels and merry-go-rounds and other kinds of rides, very similar to the, to the rides we have 70 years later. Here's the 1950s grandstand. And I loved it because they're, they are right on the track. Whatever horses or other races were going by, they could be right up front and see them. Here's a very sweet picture. I call it Lost Boy. Little Lost Boy in 1950, and the uh, uh, officer is, is trying to calm him down, holding onto his balloon, and uh, they must have had a loudspeaker announcement telling where the boy was. Of course, today, boys even that size probably have cell phones and could call their parents and say, I'm lost. But before technology, uh, they could only make an announcement. That's a very cute picture. Here's a 1950 picture as well of uh, Benson Frost one of the great people of Rhinebeck. He was a good friend of FDR, very involved in many aspects of life in Rhinebeck, and uh, Senator Hatfield standing next to him. And he left his estate to the Frost Foundation, which has been giving money for many years to not-for-profits in Rhinebeck, and we owe Mr. Frost a great debt for doing that. Is Trotters in 1951. Like I said, I wish we still had horse racing on the track today. Here's a wild postcard that I got from Susie Williams. It shows people, Trotters again, an Angus cow, and horses playing with this giant ball. So I wrote to Susie and said, what is this? And she said, it is horse soccer. Horses had teams, and they would try to put the ball over the opponent's goal. She also made a note to tell me that the Angus cow here is being held by Lee Leachman, who um, owned the famous iconic red barns on Violet Hill. And the last old picture I have of the fair, this is the fair in Ariel in 1958, a lot like it does today. But here's Mulberry Street and here's Route 9. And here are the last of the greenhouses. I think you all know that at the turn of the century, Rhinebeck had 400 greenhouses, was the violet capital of the world, selling, sending millions and millions of violet corsages to the city. But when the flapper clothing came in the 1920s, it was too light to carry the heavy violet corsages that the Victorian clothing could. And so Rhinebeck, Greenhouses went out of business. And these are some of the last of the greenhouses in 1958. So I thought I'd end with a few recent additions to the fair. Here is a 1948 picture of the, 45 picture of the Mount Ross Schoolhouse, still in Mount Ross. And of course, you know it was moved to the fairgrounds where it was the beginning of an antique village that the fair is building. Here's another picture of the Pleasant Valley train station. Some ladies, I love that hat, sitting on the platform waiting for a train. Here's another view of the other side, with a sidecar there. And this station was moved just a couple of years ago, board by board, to the fairgrounds where today it's the second building in their antique village. And so even though the fair is 200 years old, the fair continues to expand and grow. So that's the program. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, we hope to have another one of these later in the summer. And then in the fall, we'll resume our normal schedule program. You'll see the schedule in our August newsletter. At the end of September, David Turner will be talking about forgotten hamlets of Dutchess County. In the end of uh, October, Connie Lown will be talking about gravestone restoration in the Rhinebeck Cemetery and the end of uh, November, I will be talking about boarding houses of Rhinebeck. People always say, oh, people are coming up from the city every summer, and uh, there's so many of them, and that has always been true. 
100 years ago, Rhinebeck was full of summer boarding houses, and I'm going to show you some of them. So now we're going to open it up to questions and answers, and I'm going to turn it over to Mike Frazier. <laughs> you can go to so the left hand. What I'd like to do, if you, uh, anyone who would like to make a comment, you will notice in the lower right hand corner is something called reactions. If you click on that, uh, I will see a yellow uh, hand showing up on the screen and then I can unmute you. And I think uh, I see Herb Sweet there. And uh, Herb, go right ahead. Yeah, we had the camera off. Uh, uh, the camera we're using is, is not particularly good uh, on this computer. We're going to get another one. Uh, I guess my observation is that the presentation uh, seeing on the screen here uh, is, is so much more detailed than what you would normally see on the screen sitting in a, a live audience. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, it was very, uh, very, very good graphically. It, and the presentation was excellent, too. We really enjoyed it. Thank you. I recorded it. And uh, so we will be able to uh, put it up on our website over the weekend. And uh, I could send an announcement out. We had 194 members. And I didn't want to send it out to thousands of people. And then we have too many people on the screen. So um, I'll send it out and everybody can watch it like we normally do. But it was fun to do it live. And once the word gets out, hopefully more people will watch it live. Betsy, I think, uh, Betsy Press, you would have to, you can unmute yourself. Or is that simply a thumbs up on your part? I guess it's just thumbs up. Okay. Anyone else uh, wish to make a comment or add, make a question? June? Can you hear me? June, go right ahead. We can hear you. I, okay. I, I just wanted to make a comment. The first time I ever went to the fair, uh, Dutchess County Fair, uh, our family did, our oldest son, I was pregnant with our oldest son, uh, and actually he was born like four or five days later. But uh, we were visiting my parents who had a cottage in Canaan, Connecticut, but my stepmother had been, had, was born and raised in Rhinebeck and they went every year to the fair. And I remember that they had horse races back in 1968 as well. So, um, uh, but, sure. but that, so the fair is evolving and changes all the time. Well, I wish we still had horse racing and trotters. It would be a lot of fun. Yeah. They, do, they have sometimes have like uh, bull riding and stuff on the weekend. Uh -huh. But I'm not, well, we've lost the fair this year. We'll see what happens next year. At that time, it was a popular thing. Every, a lot of people went to them. Yeah. You know, I just wanted to come back to Herb Sweet's comment. It's very interesting that the image that we see here on the screen is actually of better quality than what we see when we're doing it live uh, at the Star Library. Yeah. David Byers, I think you uh, wanted to make a comment? You're yeah. on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Um, if you're, those who are familiar with my book, Our Time at Fox Hollow Farm about the Dow's family, just wanted to point out that Tracy Dow's was instrumental in moving the fair from its previous location before 1919 to, to Rhinebeck, where it has been ever since. So he was a big, important person of getting the fair to Rhinebeck. What was his uh, motivation, David, in, in doing that? I think just being a community organizer and, you know, being part of the group of Vincent Frost and uh, Jacob Strong and all the others, they just wanted to enhance Rhinebeck and thought that it would be, since it was moving around in the past, they thought, why not just bring it to Rhinebeck? And thank goodness it's stayed there ever since. Yeah. And last year was his 100th anniversary, 1919 to 2019. Right, and I provided Melanie with um, a whole lot of images from the Dow's collection of the fair over the years. So at least that's been put into a place where it's archived for that particular um, topic, which is good. Yeah, Melanie gave me some great boulders and they were, they were collected by decades, so it was really easy yeah. to go through and 
And that might have been me that did that. <laughs> and actually, I don't know, maybe I'm no doubt she used some of your material, but I understand that either she or yourself or maybe the, the have combined to uh, put together an article that will appear in the Northern Duchess News about the, since there is no fair this year, which was part of David's motivation, David Miller's motivation in putting together this program for this evening. Uh, but do you know either, David, what the story is about uh, an article appearing in Northern Duchess News? I think it was in a few weeks ago. Was it? Okay, I didn't see it. I didn't see it, no. Yeah, she, she, she showed it to me. It was, it was an article about when was, how many times was the kick fair canceled? And so she went back to, there was, you know, the hurricane, there was um, the war in 16 and 18. There were about, you know, about eight or 10 times. And she covered the history of the fair and why it was, you know, um, remember during one of the hurricanes, we lost several days of the fair. So she wrote that article about what, the other times it's been canceled. Also, I don't know if any of you are watching on uh, PBS, The Vote, the, um, the whole thing about the women's suffragette movement and all of that, which is just incredible. And there was actually a booth set up at the fair at one time during that movement, and they were overrun with women coming in and picking up buttons and uh, things of, of, you know, to support the movement. We had a talk by Bill Jeffway last, last Christmas or Christmas ago about the suffragette movement. Oh, really? Yeah, I know him. Yeah, that's great. That's great. It's up on our website. I filmed it. Oh, I'll, I'll definitely look. Right. Joanne, you look like you're about to say something. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Can you? Oh, okay. I was thinking as I was watching some of those pictures from the 40s and 50s, if Kay Verrilli was here with us, she could probably identify a lot of those people. I yeah. And when we, yeah, when we moved here in 1970, the fair used to be um, the, uh, of course, all the, the um, people, all the farmers with the animals and so forth would bring their, their, uh, animals and their crops and everything over to the fair on Monday night. And so at that time, the local people could come into the fairgrounds without charge. There was no, um, the concessions weren't open, so it was all agricultural. And so we had the little boys on our bicycles in the back and we'd ride over on Monday night. Um, one of the church fair booths was open selling, um, oh, I don't know, steak sandwiches or or something, but so I don't know. I don't really feel like I'm that old, but I guess I am. <laughs> it's it fairs wonderful, and I wonder when did when did Tracy Dow's own the Beekman Arms? Was that at the same time, maybe that the fair? David. Uh, well, that was around nineteen. Oh gosh. 16, 17, something like that. Well, so it was around the same time then. Not so. around the same time. I mean, Tracy Dow's, you know, he, <laughs> born and bred in New York City and grew up, you know, came to Rhinebeck and wanted to become sort of a, a farmer, if you will. So he a just- Gentleman had, farmer. Yes, that, yes, and had <laughs> a beautiful place, but had people working for him. But yeah. he got very involved. And I think a lot of the things we see here today are because of so it's a good thing. Well, David Miller, thank you so much. You do a beautiful job with your history and your presentations. Thanks a one, lot. One of the images that uh, looked like, even though it was taken, I think you said, David, in, in the 1940s, of the Church of Messiah food booth, is I moved here in, in, the, uh, in 1971, and I can remember every year at the fair, the Church of the Messiah food operation got uh, bigger and bigger. And it was not only the major fundraiser for the church, but it was where everybody went to get something to eat. Uh, it, was and it, was very, it was very reasonably priced. It was healthy. And it also, in order for them to make that work, Everybody, I was not a member of that congregation, 
uh, but everybody in that congregation was expected to participate in either the preparation or the serving or the cleanup. And it was a year round prep uh, affair. You, you spent a lot of time in that church yeah. getting ready for it. And when the, uh, when I guess Tom Odak uh, left as director of the fairgrounds and was replaced, there was a lot of anguish in the community when the fair decided that they would start charging for uh, those booths put up by nonprofit organizations and the Church of the Messiah was not willing to and really frankly couldn't afford what it was going to cost and uh, it was not only a disappointment for everybody in that congregation but for the entire real loss to the community. Uh, I can remember um, many years in a row slicing tomatoes in the back of that booth with Daisy Sukley. She and I uh, would, that was our job, slicing tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> I probably had a few of those slices. <laughs> the Church of the Messiah, I believe, was not the only church that had a booth. I know that the oh, Lutheran no. Church because that's the church my yes. stepmother belonged to, and they always went to that booth. But um, and I think one of the reasons they stopped doing it also was uh, to have consistency and sa safety in food. Right. Uh, well, the state was also starting to charge tax then. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, there were a variety of other reasons as yeah. as well. Um, you know, I mean, one of the other changes at the fair, um, I mean, the, there were numerous changes. David, you, you know, you've, you did a great job pointing out very quickly many, many different aspects of it. And uh, it, it, I've, uh, you know, in, in my years in Rhinebeck, it brings back a lot of memories. Sure it does. That's great, David. I had no idea it was that old. 200 years old. They started, well, this fair started in 1846, uh, yeah. but uh, yeah. they started having a fair at the turn yeah. of the century because they wanted to showcase. Uh, and today we still have, you know, the world's uh, largest pumpkins, the most beautiful flower arrangement, and, you know, the world's greatest apple pie. Because those boys were, I love the boys eating the pie. It was a lot of fun. I hope you all enjoyed it. So we'll Anyone else? Yeah, I yeah. see there's, there's somebody who just joined us. Hey, it's Betsy. Uh, Betsy. Hello. Betsy. Can you hear me? I, I can. I have a microphone on. Betsy now is, I'm on my is telephone. muted and is, uh, she would have to unmute herself. I'm assuming she's able to hear us. She's on the telephone, Mike. Yes. I can hear you. I and I can hear Betsy. You that I was born and raised in Rhinebeck. The fair was a part of my childhood from the time my, the Lutheran church had a booth next to the Episcopal church. And every day my mother would bake a special cake and I would pull it up by wagon <laughs> to the Lutheran church booth and then help uh, as a waitress or whatever. Yes, and it's true. All the per all the uh, parishioners were very involved. Um, my father was collecting, was a cashier, of course, just like he was the treasurer of the fire department. Um, and also, I wondered about the hill with the 4-H buildings. When did that um, like come into um, the fairgrounds? Because that was a major part of my life. I, I don't know. Do you do you know that, David Miller? No, I, I, I saw something about the 4-H and some of the, lit, the material. I don't remember the year that they started the 4-H barns. But that, uh -huh. that's another thing I love about the even to this day, that there are kids instead of, you know, uh, rock and roll and riding around and everything, that they still they yeah. stay home and they're grooming their pet pig. Oh, yeah. To be, to be in competition over shearing their lamb 
um, yes. to come to the fair. I so think staying yeah. and waiting in line for, for a milkshake I, is still uh, oh yes. yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah. Our favorite activity. And it's great. I love, love those milkshakes. As you know, I lived only four uh, houses from the original entrance to the fairground. So it was a very important part of my childhood. Oh, hello. <laughs> and so hello. I, hello. I couldn't miss this today at all. <laughs> hello. I think, I think I want to I pass think if Betsy Press will turn the volume off on her computer, we won't be getting this feedback going through the computer. Is that better? Uh, turn it down as much as you can. Yes, that is, that is better, Betsy. Okay. Yeah. I'll learn the next time. <laughs> I'd the rather difficulty be there, is that we, we get feedback from it. Is what I see. Watch it with the computer. Yeah, I, I hear phone. that now. You can watch yeah. it with the computer and, and, a, and a camera, or it works on an iPhone, and you can see the pictures. The same thing, as, or an iPhone or a Samsung, you can see the pictures and hear the audio the same way. And Mike and okay. I have done that in testing. And of course, when we're we say we're going to hang up on our phones because both of us are echoing because we're coming out of two microphones. But so yeah. that's great, and uh, uh, you know, we, since we can't Thank talk at the library, it's just wonderful. And as we see, someone from California can come to one of our programs. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've taken lots of notes, and I would like to um, transfer the key word uh, numbers so that I could um, pass it on to some classmates who don't live in Rhinebeck anymore. Well, I'm going to edit this thing over the next few days and okay. post it on our website and send a notice out to everybody that the okay. issue of County Fair is now up on our website. And everybody, will, I'll send it to all the members. I have a whole group of friends I send it to. And then there's a group on Facebook called Rhinebeck Past and Present, which has 3,000 members. And I post oh. it there too. And it gets us... A lot of hits on our, on, on our website. Good. Uh, the number Good. one video was 5,000 views on the history of Lionel trains. Obviously, it went viral in the antique train community. The number two was 2,000 hits on Gilded Age scandals at, <laughs> from, mm. at, from uh, uh, Mills Where Mansion. Where are you? I don't have a picture. All right. So, um, in before we adjourn, any other comments that anybody has been uh, waiting to make? I think John Vincent. John, you need to unmute yourself. Lower left. There, you, oh, there, you, there go. you go. We got you. Go ahead, John. I wondered in the research if Catherine Losey's Angus showed up. Um, at the fair, and also, wouldn't it be a kick to get um, to get uh, Marilyn Hatch on with us one of these talks? Sure. Yeah. I, she yeah, that would, that would be fantastic. She's uh, on the member list. She must be on the member list. I right? believe she yeah. is, David. Yes. So we invited 194 people, and we got about 20. So on a, on a Hurricane evening. I don't know where everybody is, but maybe they're in their storm shelters, hiding or something. But no, uh, I planned my day around this. <laughs> Catherine Losey didn't show up in the research. I I only could have what I had, and the material that I found in our archives that, that was given to me by Melanie Moore, stuff that was sent to me by Marianne Cows in Pleasant Valley. You know, it's what I had, and it was up on the. Uh, Museum website, which has some of those great pictures too. It's always, you know, that's what we always say to people. I came here to look at my grandfather. Why didn't you have it? We're not a library. We don't have A to Z. We Catherine, have what people have given to yeah. us. Catherine Losey that John is is referring to was the. She lived at the building that's referred to as the Palatine Farmstead, just north of. Uh, Rugies at the intersection of 9 and 9G, just north of the cemetery there, uh, and was the last of a gener eight generations to live in that house. Uh, she died in that house, but for much of her life, latter part of her life, she served at the fair as the judge of what was known as baby beef, 
uh, she judged the beef uh, presentations done by the young members of the 4-H club. Uh, <clears throat> and she also worked on a number of farms in, in the area. Um, and uh, my understanding is that some of the uh, exhibits that they put together at the fair uh, were stored in one of the buildings there. We, we tried uh, to get access to those uh, from um, the predecessor to Andy and Barati, but I, I didn't get anywhere, never was able to see those. Um, and we, we don't have at the Historical Society, John, any images of Catherine in her role as a judge at the fair, which is really a shame because she was really committed to that. And, uh, you know, for a lot of people who, who know nothing about her or about the history of raising beef cattle here in Rhinebeck, um, the, one of the farms that she worked on was Creed Ankeny, and they were a premier farm operation, not just locally, but nationally and internationally. Uh, they competed with, a, one of the images that David showed was a champion, um, I, I'm sure if I was in the beef business, I, I would get this term right, but uh, Brahma bull or whatever it was. David, Black Angus. Black Angus. Black Angus. There we go. Uh, but those, raising those cattle was serious, serious business. And there were several ranchers here in Rhinebeck who did that exceptionally well and uh, eventually uh, Creed Ankeny moved out to and is today in Montana, uh, but they would win the cattle shows in Argentina. Um, and Catherine Losey was the one who used to ride on the trucks uh, because they knew that when they got to Chicago to the international shows that took place for many years in Chicago, when she would ride with those beef cattle, the cattle were less nervous and they showed better and she took care of them. Uh, that, was, that was what she was a pro at, and she was well known in the cattle business for doing that. It's, it's a shame we don't have more records, about more images of her. Um, I was talking with Susie Williams about the cows, and uh, I got inspired to do some research and write an article for one of the newsletters next year about this uh, uh, history of the Angus cow and the bulls in Creed Ackney Farm and Rhinebeck. So I'm going to try to dig into this in the next few months and put together an article um, about that. Okay. All righty. So the details will be going out in our uh, August newsletter. Mike's putting together, a, revising an old article about the 1918 flu. And uh, we'll have our list of programs. And unfortunately, we're probably going to still have to do it this way, but you know, it, it's okay. We've had three very successful planning board meetings with six applicants at each meeting, each applicant showing a PowerPoint of what they want to do to their houses and everybody could see and it was, uh, it's very, very successful. Yeah. Well, you're, you're doing very well. Our, our zoning board meetings in Hyde Park have not been quite that smooth. Well, that's zoning. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. So, um, so, David, thank you for putting yes. together a terrific program, doing that research uh, with a little help from your friends. Bravo. And uh, we look forward to the next program. We haven't got a date yet, but uh, this, is, this is basically a trial run. Uh, right. And uh, we're just trying out this Zoom business to see how it works to do a program. It, it's hard it to do because I miss seeing all of you in person, people are laughing at my jokes, and you know, it's like, how are the Yankees <laughs> going to play to an empty <laughs> stadium? That's what somebody going to play. The Yankees playing to an empty stadium, no one cheering them on. How does a comedian go on to an empty theater and nobody's laughing? I mean, it's it's difficult to do. And I, I did the first run through, and my wife said, You were terrible. You really have to pretend they're there because they are there and be animated like you normally are, not just say, in the beginning, God created the earth in seven days. You know, 
get get into it. And uh, I practiced it several times, and I hope it was better tonight than the first time because she yelled at me and said, boring, get more excited like you normally are. It's hard to do without a crowd. And uh, I feel bad for football and baseball and everything. You know, oh, yay for Cecily. Yay. <laughs> Hey, that was cute. Cute. I have a solution. Uh, get, get yourself a laugh track. <laughs> yes, that's what somebody says. To get a laugh track, they go, you can push a button or maybe take a picture from one of the old presentations of the audience and stick it up on the wall behind the, the computer and I could see the crowd and feel like I'm in the library. So I have to apologize. <laughs> there are no brownies on the way out. But, yes, there are no brownies on the way out. But we in any event... Out. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. It's great. I'll talk to you next week. Great, great images. Everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Ta-ta. Bye-bye.